three, the Eden Home, a pattern. The Eden home of our first parents was prepared for them by God, thing that man could desire. He said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. The Lord was pleased with this last and noblest of all his creatures, and designed that he should be the perfect inhabitant of a perfect world. But it was not his purpose that man should live in solitude. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. God himself gave Adam a companion. He provided an help meet for him, a helper corresponding to him one who was fitted to be his companion and who could be one with him in love and in sympathy. Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as an equal to be loved and protected by him, a part of man, bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh. She was his second self, showing the close union and the affectionate attachment that should exist in this relation. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one. God celebrated the first marriage. Thus the institution has the creator of the universe. Marriage is honorable. It was one of the first gifts of God to man. And it is one of the two institutions that, after the fall, Adam brought with him beyond the gates of paradise. When the divine principles are recognized and obeyed in this relation, Marriage is a blessing. It guards the purity and happiness of the race. It provides for man's social needs. It elevates the physical, the intellectual, and the moral nature. He who gave Eve to Adam as a help meet performed his first miracle at a marriage festival. In the festal hall where friends and kindred rejoiced together, Christ began his public ministry. Thus, he sanctioned marriage, recognizing it as an institution that he himself had established. Christ honored the marriage relation by making it also a symbol of the union between him and his redeemed ones. He himself is the bridegroom. The bride is the church, of which, as his chosen one, he says, Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Adam was surrounded with everything his heart could wish. Every want was supplied. There were no sin and no signs of decay in glorious Eden. Angels of God conversed freely and lovingly with the holy pair. The happy songsters caroled forth their free, joyous songs of praise to their creator. The peaceful beasts in happy innocence played about Adam and Eve, obedient to their word in the perfection of manhood 
the noblest of the creator's work. Not a shadow interposed between them and their creator. They knew God as their beneficent father. And in all things, their will was conformed to the will of God. And God's character was reflected in the character of Adam. His glory was revealed in every object of nature. God is a lover of the beautiful. He has given us unmistakable evidence of this in the work of his hands. He planted for our first parents a beautiful garden in Eden. Stately trees were caused to grow out of the ground of every description for usefulness and ornament. The beautiful flowers were formed of rare loveliness, of every tint and hue, perfuming the air. It was the design of God that man should find happiness in the employment of tending the things he had created, and that his wants should be met with the fruits of the trees of the garden. To Adam was given the work of caring for the garden. The creator knew that Adam could not be happy without employment. The beauty of the garden delighted him, but this was not enough. He must have labor to call into exercise the wonderful organs of his body. Had happiness consisted in doing nothing, man in his state of holy innocence would have been left unemployed. But he who created man knew what would be for his happiness. And no sooner had he created him than he gave him his appointed work. The promise of future glory and the decree that man must toil for his daily bread came from the same throne. Fathers and mothers who make God first in their households, who teach their children that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, glorify God before angels and before men by presenting to the world a well-ordered, well-disciplined family, a family that love and obey God instead of rebelling against him. Christ is not a stranger in their homes. His name is a household name, revered and glorified. Angels delight in a home where God reigns supreme and the children are taught to reverence religion, the Bible, and their creator. Such families can claim the promise, them that honor me, I will honor. As from such a home, the father goes forth to his daily duties, soft and then subdued by converse with God. The presence of Christ alone can make men and women happy. All the common waters of life, Christ can turn into the wine of heaven. The home then becomes as an Eden of bliss. The family, a beautiful symbol of the family in heaven. Section 2, A Light in the Community. Chapter 4, Far-Reaching Influence of the Home. The mission of the home extends beyond its own members. The Christian home is to be an object lesson illustrating the excellence of the true principles of life. Such an illustration will be a power for good in the world. As a youth go out from such a home, the lessons they have learned are imparted. Nobler principles of life are introduced into other households, and an uplifting influence works in the community. The home in which the members are polite, 
courteous Christians, exerts a far-reaching influence for good. Other families will mark the results attained by such a home and will follow the example set, in their turn guarding the home against satanic influences. The angels of God will often visit the home in which the will of God bears sway. Under the power of divine grace, such a home becomes a place of refreshing to warn weary pilgrims. By watchful guarding, self is kept from asserting itself. Correct habits are formed. There is a careful recognition of the rights of others. The faith that works by love and purifies the soul stands at the helm, presiding over the whole household. Under the hallowed influence of such a home, the principle of brotherhood laid down in the word of God is more widely recognized and obeyed. It is no small matter for a family to stand as representatives of Jesus, keeping God's law in an unbelieving community. We are required to be living epistles known and read of all men. This position involves fearful responsibilities. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Such a family gives evidence that the parents have been successful in following God's directions and that their children will serve him in the church. Their influence grows, for as they impart, they receive to impart again. The father and mother find helpers in their children who give to others the instruction received in the home. The neighborhood in which they live is helped, for in it they have become enriched for time and for eternity. The whole family is engaged in the service of the master, and by their godly example, others are inspired to be faithful and true to God in dealing with his flock his beautiful flock. The greatest evidence of the power of Christianity that can be presented to the world is a well-ordered, well-disciplined family. This will recommend the truth as nothing else can, for it is a living witness of its practical power upon the heart. The best test of the Christianity of a home is the type of character begotten by its influence. Actions speak louder than the most positive profession of godliness. Our business in this world is to see what virtues we can teach our children and our families to possess, that they shall have an influence upon other families. And thus, we can be an educating power, although we can never enter into the desk a well-ordered, a well-disciplined family in the sight of God is more precious than fine gold, even than the golden wedge of Ophir. Our time here is short. We can pass through this world but once. As we pass along, let us make the most of life. The work to which we are called does not require wealth or social position or great ability. It requires a kindly, self-sacrificing spirit and a steadfast purpose. A lamp, however small, if kept steadily burning, may be the means of lighting many other lamps. Our sphere of influence may seem narrow, our ability small, our opportunities few, our acquirements limited, yet wonderful possibilities are ours through a faithful use 
of the opportunities of our own homes. If we will open our hearts and homes to the divine principles of life, we shall become channels for currents of life-giving power. From our homes will flow streams of healing, bringing life and beauty and fruitfulness where now are barrenness and dearth. God-fearing parents will diffuse an influence from their own home circle to that of others that will act as did the leaven that was hid in three measures of meal. Faithful work done in the home educates others to do the same class of work. The spirit of fidelity to God is like leaven, and when manifested in the church, will have an effect upon others and will be a recommendation to Christianity everywhere. The work of whole-souled soldiers of Christ is as far-reaching as eternity. Then why is it that there is such a lack of the missionary spirit in our churches? It is because there is a neglect of home piety. The influence of an ill-regulated family is widespread and disastrous to all society. It accumulates in a tide of evil that affects families, communities, and governments. It is impossible for any of us to live in such a way that we shall not cast an influence in the world. No member of the family can enclose himself within himself, where other members of the family shall not feel his influence and spirit. The very expression of the countenance has an influence for good or evil. His spirit, his words, his actions, his attitude toward others are unmistakable. If he is living in selfishness, he surrounds his soul with a malarious atmosphere. While if he is filled with the love of Christ, he will manifest courtesy, kindness, tender regard for the feelings of others, and will communicate to his associates by his acts of love, a tender, grateful, happy feeling. It will be made manifest that he is living for Jesus and daily learning lessons at his feet, receiving his light and his peace. He will be able to say to the Lord, Thy gentleness hath made me great. Chapter 5 A Powerful Christian Witness. Missionaries for the master are best prepared for work abroad in the Christian household, where God is feared, where God is loved, where God is worshipped, where faithfulness has become second nature, where haphazard, careless inattention to home duties is not permitted, where quiet communion with God is looked upon as essential to the faithful performance of daily duties. Home duties should be performed with a consciousness that if they are done in the right spirit, they give an experience that will enable us to work for Christ in the most permanent and thorough manner. Oh, what might not a Christian do in missionary lines by performing faithfully the daily duties, cheerfully lifting the cross, not neglecting any work, however disagreeable to the natural feelings. 
Our work for Christ is to begin with the family, in the home. There is no missionary field more important than this. By many, this home field has become shamefully neglected, and it is time that divine resources and remedies were presented that this state of evil may be corrected. The highest duty that devolves upon youth is in their own homes, blessing father and mother, brothers and sisters. Here they can show self-denial and others. What an influence a sister may have over brothers. If she is right, she may determine the character of her brothers, her prayers, her gentleness, and her affection may do much in a household. In the home, those who have received Christ are to show what grace has done for them. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. A conscious authority pervades the true believer in Christ that makes its influence felt throughout the home. This is favorable for the perfection of the characters of all in the home. A well-ordered Christian household is a powerful argument in favor of the reality of the Christian religion, an argument that the infidel cannot gainsay. All can see that there is an influence at work in the family that affects the children and that the God of Abraham is with them. If the homes of professed Christians had a right religious mold, they would exert a mighty influence for good. They would indeed be the light of the world. Children who have been properly educated who love to be useful, to help father and mother, will extend a knowledge of correct ideas and Bible principles to all with whom they associate. When our homes are what they should be, our children will not be allowed to grow up in idleness and indifference to the claims of God in behalf of the needy all about them. As the Lord's heritage, they will be qualified to take up the work where they are. A light will shine from such homes, which will reveal itself in behalf of the ignorant, leading them to the source of all knowledge. An influence will be exerted that will be a power for God and for his truth. Parents who can be approached in no other way are frequently reached through their children. We need more sunshiny parents and more sunshiny Christians. We're too much shut up within ourselves. Too often the kindly encouraging word, the cheery smile, are withheld from our children and from the oppressed and discouraged. Parents upon you rest the responsibility of being light bearers and light givers shine as lights in the home brightening the path that your children must travel as you do this your light will shine to those without from every christian home a holy light should shine forth love should be revealed in action it should flow out in all home intercourse showing itself in thoughtful kindness, in gentle, unselfish courtesy. There are homes where this principle is carried out, homes where God is worshipped and truest love reigns. From these homes, morning and evening prayer ascends to God as sweet incense, and his mercies and blessings descend upon the suppliants like the morning dew. The first work of Christians is to be united in the family. Then the work is to extend to their neighbors nigh and afar off, 
Those who have received light are to let the light shine forth in clear rays. Their words, fragrant with the love of Christ, are to be a savor of life unto life. The more closely the members of a family are united in their work in the home, the more uplifting and helpful will be the influence that father and mother and sons and daughters will exert outside the home. The happiness of families and churches depends upon home influences. Eternal interests depend upon the proper discharge of the duties of this life. The world is not so much in need of great minds as of good men who will be a blessing in their homes. When religion is manifested in the home, its influence will be felt in the church and in the neighborhood. But some who profess to be Christians talk with their neighbors concerning their home difficulties. They relate their grievances in such a way as to call for sympathy for themselves. But it is a great mistake to pour our trouble into the ears of others, especially when many of our grievances are manufactured and exist because of our irreligious life and defective character. Those who go forth to lay their private grievances before others might better remain at home to pray, to surrender their perverse will to God, to fall on the rock and be broken, to die to self, that Jesus may make them vessels unto honor. A lack of courtesy, a moment of petulance, a single rough, thoughtless word will mar your reputation and may close the door to hearts so that you can never reach them. The effort to make the home what it should be, a symbol of the home in heaven, prepares us for work in a larger sphere. The education received by showing a tender regard for each other enables us to know how to reach hearts that need to be taught the principles of true religion. The church needs all the cultivated spiritual force which can be obtained, that all and especially the younger members of the Lord's family may be carefully guarded. The truth lived at home makes itself felt in disinterested labor abroad. He who lives Christianity in the home will be a bright and shining light everywhere. Section 3, Choosing the Life Partner. Chapter 6, The Great Decision. If those who are contemplating marriage would not have miserable, unhappy reflections after marriage, they must make it a subject of serious, earnest reflection now. This step, taken unwisely, is one of the most effective means of ruining the usefulness of young men and women. Life becomes a burden, a curse. No one can so effectually ruin a woman's happiness and usefulness and make life a heart-sickening burden as her own husband. And no one can do one hundredth part as much to chill the hopes and aspirations of a man to paralyze his energies and ruin his influence and prospects as his own wife. It is from the marriage hour that many men and women date their success or failure in this life and their hopes of the future life. I wish I could make the youth see and feel their danger, especially the danger of making unhappy marriages. Marriage is something that will influence and affect your life, both in this world and in the world to come. 
A sincere Christian will not advance his plans in this direction without the knowledge that God approves his course. He will not want to choose for himself, but will feel that God must choose for him. We are not to please ourselves, for Christ pleased not himself. I would not be understood to mean that anyone is to marry one whom he does not love. This would be sin. But fancy and the emotional nature must not be allowed to lead on to ruin. God requires the whole heart, the supreme affections. Few have correct views of the marriage relation. Many seem to think that it is the attainment of perfect bliss. But if they could know one quarter of the heartaches of men and women that are bound by the marriage vow in chains that they cannot and dare not break, they would not be surprised that I trace these lines. Marriage in a majority of cases is a most galling yoke. There are thousands that are mated, but not matched. The books of heaven are burdened with the woes, the wickedness, and the abuse that lie hidden under the marriage mantle. This is why I would warn the young who are of marriageable age to make haste slowly in the choice of a companion. The path of married life may appear beautiful and full of happiness, but why may not you be disappointed as thousands of others have been? Those who are contemplating marriage should consider what will be the character and influence of the home they are founding. As they become parents, a sacred trust is committed to them. Upon them depends in a great measure the well-being of their children in this world and their happiness in the world to come. To a great extent, they determine both the physical and the moral stamp that the little ones receive. And upon the character of the home depends the condition of society. The weight of each family's influence will tell in the upward or the downward scale. Great care should be taken by Christian youth in the formation of friendships and in the choice of companions. Take heed, lest what you now think to be pure gold turns out to be base metal. Worldly associations tend to place obstructions in the way of your service to God. And many souls are ruined by unhappy unions, either business or matrimonial, with those who can never elevate or ennoble. Weigh every sentiment and watch every development of character in the one with whom you think to link your life destiny. The step you are about to take is one of the most important in your life and should not be taken hastily. While you may love, do not love blindly. Examine carefully to see if your married life would be happy or inharmonious and wretched. Let the questions be raised. Will this union help me heavenward? Will it increase my love for God? And will it enlarge my sphere of usefulness in this life? If these reflections present no drawback, then in the fear of God, move forward. Most men and women have acted in entering the marriage relation as though the only question for them to settle was whether they love each other. But they should realize that a responsibility rests upon them in the marriage relation farther than this. They should consider whether their offspring will possess physical health and mental and moral strength. But few have moved 
with high motives and with elevated considerations, which they could not lightly throw off, that society had claims upon them that the weight of their family's influence would tell in the upward or downward scale. The choice of a life companion should be such as best to secure physical, mental, and spiritual well-being for parents and for their children, such as will enable both parents and children to bless their fellow men and to honor their creator. Let a young man seek one to stand by his side who is fitted to bear her share of life's burdens, one whose influence will ennoble and refine him and who will make him happy in her love. A prudent wife is from the Lord. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also. And he praiseth her, saying, Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. He who gains such a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Here are things which should be considered. Will the one you marry bring happiness to your home? Is she an economist or will she, if married, not only use all her own earnings, but all of yours to gratify a vanity, a love of appearance? Are her principles correct in this direction? Has she anything now to depend upon? I know that in the mind of a man infatuated with love and thoughts of marriage, these questions will be brushed away as though they were of no consequence. But these things should be duly considered, for they have a bearing upon your future life. In your choice of a wife, study her character. Will she be one who will be patient and painstaking? Or will she cease to care for your mother and father at the very time when they need a strong son to lean upon? And will she withdraw him from their society to carry out her plans and to suit her own pleasure and leave the father and mother who, instead of gaining an affectionate daughter, will have lost a son? Before giving her hand in marriage, every woman should inquire whether he, with whom she is about to unite her destiny is worthy. What has been his past record? Is his life pure? Is the love which he expresses of a noble, elevated character, or is it a mere emotional fondness? Has he the traits of character that will make her happy? Can she find true peace and joy in his affection? Will she be allowed to preserve her individuality? Or must her judgment and conscience be surrendered to the control of her husband? Can she honor the Savior's claims as supreme? Will body and soul, thoughts and purposes be preserved pure and holy? These questions have a vital bearing upon the well-being of every woman who enters the marriage relation. Let the woman who desires a peaceful, happy union, who would escape future misery and sorrow, inquire before she yields her affections. Has my lover a mother? What is the stamp of her character? Does he recognize his obligations to her? Is he mindful of her wishes and happiness? If he does not respect and honor his mother, will he manifest respect and love, kindness and attention toward his wife? When the novelty of marriage is over, will he love me still? Will he be patient with my mistakes or will he be critical 
overbearing and dictatorial. True affection will overlook many mistakes. Love will not discern them. Let a young woman accept as a life companion only one who possesses pure manly traits of character, one who is diligent, aspiring, and honest, one who loves and fears God. Shun those who are irreverent. Shun one who is a lover of idleness. Shun the one who is a scoffer of hallowed things. Avoid the society of one who uses profane language or who is addicted to the use of even one glass of liquor. Listen not to the proposals of a man who has no realization of his responsibility to God. The pure truth which sanctifies the soul will give you courage to cut yourself loose from the most pleasing acquaintance whom you know does not love and fear God and knows nothing of the principles of true righteousness. We may always bear with a friend's infirmities and with his ignorance, but never with his vices. Marriages that are impulsive and selfishly planned generally do not result well, but often turn out miserable failures. Both parties find themselves deceived and gladly would they undo that which they did under an infatuation. It is easier, far easier, to make a mistake in this matter than to correct the error after it is made. Even if an engagement has been entered into without a full understanding of the character of the one with whom you intend to unite, do not think that the engagement makes it a positive necessity for you to take upon yourself the marriage vow and link yourself for life to one whom you cannot love and respect. Be very careful how you enter into conditional engagements, but better, far better, break the engagement before marriage than separate afterward, as many do. You may say, but I've given my promise. And shall I now retract it? I answer, if you have made a promise contrary to the scriptures, by all means retract it without delay. And in humility before God, repent of the infatuation that led you to make so rash a pledge. Far better take back such a promise in the fear of God than keep it and thereby dishonor your maker. Let every step toward a marriage alliance be characterized by modesty, simplicity, sincerity, and an earnest purpose to please and honor God. Marriage affects the afterlife, both in this world and in the world to come. A sincere Christian will make no plans that God cannot approve. Chapter 7, True Love or Infatuation Love is a precious gift, which we receive from Jesus. Pure and holy affection is not a feeling, but a principle. Those who are actuated by true love are neither unreasonable nor blind. There is but little real, genuine, devoted, pure love. This precious article is very rare. Passion is termed love. True love is a high and holy principle, altogether different in character from that love which is awakened by impulse and which suddenly dies when severely tested. Love is a plant of heavenly growth and it must be fostered and nourished. Affectionate hearts, truthful, loving words will make happy families and exert an elevating influence upon all who come within the sphere of their influence. 
Love is not unreasonable. It is not blind. It is pure and holy. But the passion of the natural heart is another thing altogether. While pure love will take God into all its plans and will be in perfect harmony with the spirit of God, passion will be headstrong, rash, unreasonable, defiant of all restraint, and will make the object of its choice an idol. In all the department of one who possesses true love, the grace of God will be shown. Modesty, simplicity, sincerity, morality, and religion will characterize every step toward an alliance in marriage. Those who are thus controlled will not be absorbed in each other's society at a loss of interest in the prayer meeting and the religious service. Their fervor for the truth will not die on account of the neglect of the opportunities and privileges that God has graciously given to them. That love which has no better foundation than mere sensual gratification will be headstrong, blind, and uncontrollable. Honor, truth, and every noble, elevated power of the mind are brought under the slavery of passions. The man who is bound in the chains of this infatuation is too often deaf to the voice of reason and conscience. Neither argument nor entreaty can lead him to see the folly of his course. True love is not a strong, fiery, impetuous passion. On the contrary, it is calm and deep in its nature. It looks beyond mere externals and is attracted by qualities alone. It is wise and discriminating, and its devotion is real and abiding. Love, lifted out of the realm of passion and impulse, becomes spiritualized and is revealed in words and acts. A Christian must have a sanctified tenderness and love in which there is no impatience or fretfulness. The rude, harsh manners must be softened by the grace of Christ. Imagination, lovesick sentimentalism should be guarded against as would be the leprosy. Very many of the young men and women in this age of the world are lacking in virtue. Therefore, great caution is needed. Those who have preserved a virtuous character, although they may lack in other desirable qualities, may be of real moral worth. There are persons who have for some time made a profession of religion who are, to all intents and purposes, without God and without a sensitive conscience. They are vain and trifling. Their conversation is of a low order. Courtship and marriage occupy the mind to the exclusion of higher and nobler thoughts. The young are bewitched with a mania for courtship and marriage. Lovesick sentimentalism prevails. Great vigilance and tact are needed to guard the youth from these wrong influences. Daughters are not taught self-denial and self-control. They are petted and their pride is fostered. They are allowed to have their own way until they become headstrong and self-willed. And you are put to your wit's end to know what course to pursue to save them from ruin. Satan is leading them on to be a proverb in the mouth of unbelievers because of their boldness, their lack of reserve and womanly modesty. The young boys are likewise left to have their own way. They have scarcely entered their teens before they are by the side of little girls of their own age, accompanying them home and making love to them. And the parents are so completely in bondage through their own indolence and mistaken love for their children that they dare not pursue a decided course to make a change and restrain their too fast children in this fast age. 
counsel to a romantic, lovesick girl. You have fallen into the sad error which is so prevalent in this degenerate age, especially with women. You are too fond of the other sex. You love their society. Your attention to them is flattering and you encourage or permit a familiarity which does not always accord with the exhortation of the apostle to abstain from all appearance of evil. Turn your mind away from romantic projects. You mingle with your religion a romantic lovesick sentimentalism, which does not elevate but only lowers. It is not yourself alone who is affected. Others are injured by your example and influence. Daydreaming and romantic castle building have unfitted you for usefulness. You have lived in an imaginary world. You have been an imaginary martyr and an imaginary Christian. There is much of this low sentimentalism mingled with the religious experience of the young in this age of the world. My sister, God requires you to be transformed. Elevate your affections, I implore you. Devote your mental and physical powers to the service of your Redeemer, who has bought you. Sanctify your thoughts and feelings, that all your works may be wrought in God. Caution to a youthful student. You are now in your student's life. Let your mind dwell upon spiritual subjects. Keep all sentimentalism apart from your life. Give to yourself vigilant self-instruction and bring yourself under self-control. You are now in the formative period of character. Nothing with you is to be considered trivial or unimportant, which will detract from your highest, holiest interest, your efficiency in the preparation to do the work God has assigned you. Results of unwise courtship and marriage. We can see that innumerable difficulties meet us at every step. The iniquity that is cherished by young as well as old, the unwise, unsanctified courtship and marriages cannot fail to result in bickerings, in strife, in alienations, in indulgence of unbridled passions, in unfaithfulness of husbands and wives, unwillingness to restrain the self-willed, inordinate desires, and in indifference to the things of eternal interests. The holiness of the oracles of God is not loved by very many who claim to be Bible Christians. They show by their free, loose conduct that they prefer a wider scope they do not want their selfish indulgences limited. Gird up the loins of your mind, says the apostle. Then control your thoughts, not allowing them to have full scope. The thoughts may be guarded and controlled by your own determined efforts. Think right thoughts and you will perform right actions. You have then to guard the affections, not letting them go out and fasten upon improper objects. Jesus has purchased you with his own life. You belong to him. Therefore, he is to be consulted in all things as to how the powers of your mind and the affections of your heart shall be employed. Chapter 8, Common Courtship Practices. The ideas of courtship have their foundation in erroneous ideas concerning marriage. They follow impulse and blind passion. The courtship is carried on in a spirit of flirtation. The parties frequently violate the rules of modesty and reserve and are guilty of indiscretion if they do not break the law of God. The high, noble, lofty design of God in the institution of marriage is not discerned. Therefore, the purest affections of the heart, the noblest traits of character, are not developed. Not one word should be spoken, 
not one action performed, that you would not be willing the holy angels should look upon and register in the books of heaven. You should have an eye single to the glory of God. The heart should have only pure, sanctified affection, worthy of the followers of Jesus Christ, exalted in its nature and more heavenly than earthly. Anything different from this is debasing, degrading in courtship, and marriage cannot be holy and honorable in the sight of a pure and holy God unless it is after the exalted scriptural principle. The youth trust altogether too much to impulse. They should not give themselves away too easily, nor be captivated too readily by the winning exterior of the lover. Courtship, as carried on in this age, is a scheme of deception and hypocrisy with which the enemy of souls has far more to do than the Lord. Good common sense is needed here, if anywhere, but the fact is, it has little to do in the matter. The habit of sitting up late at night is customary, but it is not pleasing to God. Even if you are both Christians, these untimely hours injure health, unfit the mind for the next day's duties, and have an appearance of evil. My brother, I hope you will have self-respect enough to shun this form of courtship. If you have an eye single to the glory of God, you will move with deliberate caution. You will not suffer lovesick sentimentalism to so blind your vision that you cannot discern the high claims that God has upon you as a Christian. Satan's angels are keeping watch with those who devote a large share of the night to courting. Could they have their eyes open, they would see an angel making a record of their words and acts. The laws of health and modesty are violated. It would be more appropriate to let some of the hours of courtship before marriage run through the married life. But as a general thing, Marriage ends all the devotion manifested during the days of courtship. These hours of midnight dissipation in this age of depravity frequently lead to the ruin of both parties thus engaged. Satan exalts, and God is dishonored when men and women dishonor themselves. The good name of honor is sacrificed under the spell of this infatuation and the marriage of such persons cannot be solemnized under the approval of God. They are married because passion moved them. And when the novelty of the affair is over, they will begin to realize what they have done. Satan knows just what elements he has to deal with. And he displays his infernal wisdom in various devices to entrap souls to their ruin. He watches every step that is taken and makes many suggestions. And often these suggestions are followed rather than the counsel of God's word. This finely woven dangerous net is skillfully prepared to entangle the young and unwary. It may often be disguised under the covering of a light but those who become its victims pierce themselves through with many sorrows. As the result, we see wrecks of humanity everywhere. To trifle with hearts is a crime of no small magnitude in the sight of a holy God. And yet, some will show preference for young ladies call out their affections, then go their way and forget all about the words they have spoken and their effect. A new face attracts them and they repeat the same words, devote to another the same attentions. This disposition will reveal itself in the married life. The marriage relation does not always make the fickle mind firm the wavering, steadfast, and true to principle. 
They tire of constancy, and unholy thoughts will manifest themselves in unholy actions. How essential it is, then, that the youth so gird up the loins of their mind and guard their conduct that Satan cannot beguile them from the path of uprightness. A young man who enjoys the society and wins the friendship of a young lady unbeknown to her parents does not act a noble Christian part toward her or toward her parents. Through secret communications and meetings, he may gain an influence over her mind, but in so doing, he fails to manifest that nobility and integrity of soul which every child of God will possess. In order to accomplish their ends, they act a part that is not frank and open and according to the Bible standard and prove themselves untrue to those who love them and try to be faithful guardians over them. Marriages contracted under such influences are not according to the word of God. He who would lead a daughter away from duty, who would confuse her ideas of God's plain and positive commands to obey and honor her parents, is not one who would be true to the marriage obligations. Thou shalt not steal was written by the finger of God upon the tables of stone. Yet how much underhand stealing of affections is practiced and excused. A deceptive courtship is maintained. Private communications are kept up until the affections of one who is inexperienced and knows not whereunto these things may grow are in a measure withdrawn from her parents and placed upon him who shows by the very course he pursues that he is unworthy of her love. The Bible condemns every species of dishonesty. This underhand way in which courtships and marriages are carried on is the cause of a great amount of misery, the full extent of which is known only to God. On this rock, thousands have made shipwreck of their souls. Professed Christians whose lives are marked with integrity and who seem sensible upon every other subject make fearful mistakes here. They manifest a set, determined will that reason cannot change. They become so fascinated with human feelings and impulses that they have no desire to search the Bible and come into close relationship with God. When one commandment is broken, the downward steps are almost certain. When once the barriers of female modesty are removed, the basest licentiousness does not appear exceeding sinful. Alas, what terrible results of woman's influence for evil may be witnessed in the world today. Through the allurements of strange women, thousands are incarcerated in prison cells. Many take their own lives and many cut short the lives of others. How true the words of inspiration. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Beacons of warning are placed on every side in the pathway of life to prevent men from approaching the dangerous forbidden ground. But notwithstanding this, Multitudes choose the fatal path, contrary to the dictates of reason, regardless of God's law and in defiance of his vengeance. Those who would preserve physical health, a vigorous intellect, and sound morals must flee youthful lust. Those who will put forth zealous and decided efforts to check the wickedness that lifts its bold, presumptuous head in our midst are hated and maligned by all wrongdoers, but they will be honored and recompensed of God. 
You must not imperil your souls by sowing wild oats. You cannot afford to be careless in regard to the companions you choose. A little time spent in sowing your wild oats, dear young friends, will produce a crop that will embitter your whole life. An hour of thoughtlessness, once yielding to temptation, may turn the whole current of your life in the wrong direction. You can have but one youth. Make that useful. When once you have passed over the ground, you can never return to rectify your mistakes. He who refuses to connect with God and puts himself in the way of temptation will surely fall. God is testing every youth. Many have excused their carelessness and irreverence because of the wrong example given them by more experienced professors. But this should not deter any from right doing. In the day of final accounts, you will plead no such excuses as you plead now. Chapter 9, Forbidden Marriages There is in the Christian world an astonishing, alarming indifference to the teaching of God's word in regard to the marriage of Christians with unbelievers. Many who profess to love and fear God choose to follow the bent of their own minds rather than take counsel of infinite wisdom. In a matter which vitally concerns the happiness and well-being of both parties for this world and the next, reason, judgment, and the fear of God are set aside and blind impulse, stubborn determination, are allowed to control. Men and women who are otherwise sensible and conscientious close their ears to counsel. They are deaf to the appeals and entreaties of friends and kindred and of the servants of God. The expression of a caution or warning is regarded as impertinent meddling, and the friend who is faithful enough to utter a remonstrance is treated as an enemy. All this is as Satan would have it. He weaves his spell about the soul. It becomes bewitched, infatuated. Reason lets fall the reins of self-control upon the neck of lust. Unsanctified passion bears sway until too late. The victim awakens to a life of misery and bondage. This is not a picture drawn by the imagination, but a recital of facts. God's sanction is not given to unions, which he has expressly forbidden. The Lord commanded ancient Israel not to intermarry with the idolatrous nations around them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. The reason is given, infinite wisdom foreseeing the result of such unions declares, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. In the New Testament are similar prohibitions concerning the marriage of Christians with the ungodly. The Apostle Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, declares, The wife 
is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Again, in his second epistle, he writes, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. Their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my son. And daughters, said the Lord Almighty. The curse of God rests upon many of the ill-timed, inappropriate connections that are formed in this age of the world. If the Bible left these questions in a vague, uncertain light, then the course that many youth of today are pursuing in their attachments for one another would be more excusable. But the requirements of the Bible are not halfway injunctions. They demand perfect purity of thought, of word, and of deed. We are grateful to God that his word is a light to the feet and that none need mistake the path of duty. The young should make it a business to consult its pages and heed its counsels for sad mistakes are always made in departing from its precepts. Never should God's people venture upon forbidden ground. Marriage between believers and unbelievers is forbidden by God. But too often, the unconverted heart follows its own desires, and marriages unsanctioned by God are formed. Because of this, many men and women are without hope and without God in the world. Their noble aspirations are dead. By a chain of circumstances, they are held in Satan's net. Those who are ruled by passion and impulse will have a bitter harvest to reap in this life, and their course may result in the loss of their souls. Those who profess the truth trample on the will of God in marrying unbelievers. They lose his favor and make bitter work for repentance. The unbelieving may possess an excellent moral character, but the fact that he or she has not answered to the claims of God and has neglected so great salvation is sufficient reason why such a union should not be consummated. The character of the unbelieving may be similar to that of the young man to whom Jesus addressed the words, One thing thou lackest. That was the one thing needful. There are men of poverty and obscurity whose lives God would accept and make full of usefulness on earth and of glory in heaven. But Satan is working persistently to defeat his purposes and drag them down to perdition by marriage with those whose character is such that they throw themselves directly across the road to life. Very few come out from this entanglement triumphant. 
Satan well knew the results that would attend obedience. And during the earlier years of Solomon's reign, years glorious because of the wisdom, the beneficence, and the uprightness of the king, he sought to bring in influences that would insidiously undermine Solomon's loyalty to principle and cause him to separate from God. And that the enemy was successful in this effort, we know from the record. Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David. In forming an alliance with a heathen nation and sealing the compact by marriage, with an idolatrous princess, Solomon rashly disregarded the wise provisions that God had made for maintaining the purity of his people. The hope that this Egyptian wife might be converted was but a feeble excuse for the sin. In violation of a direct command to remain separate from other nations, the king united his strength with the arm of flesh. For a time, God in his compassionate mercy overruled this terrible mistake. Solomon's wife was converted, and the king, by a wise course, might have done much to check the evil forces that his imprudence had set in operation. But Solomon began to lose sight of the source of his power and glory. Inclination gained the ascendancy over reason. As his self-confidence increased, he sought to carry out the Lord's purpose in his own way. Many professed Christians think like Solomon, that they may unite with the ungodly because their influence over those who are in the wrong will be beneficial, but too often they themselves, entrapped and overcome, yield their sacred faith, sacrifice principle, and separate themselves from God. One false step leads to another, till at last they place themselves where they cannot hope to break the chains that Find them. The plea is sometimes made that the unbeliever is favorable to religion and is all that could be desired in a companion except in one thing, he is not a Christian. Although the better judgment of the believer may suggest the impropriety of a union for life with an unbeliever, yet in nine cases out of ten, Inclination triumphs. Spiritual declension commences the moment the vow is made at the altar. Religious fervor is dampened, and one stronghold after another is broken down until both stand side by side under the black banner of Satan. Even in the festivities of the wedding, the spirit of the world triumphs against conscience, faith, and truth. In the new home, the hour of prayer is not respected. The bride and bridegroom have chosen each other and dismissed Jesus. At first, the unbelieving one may make no show of opposition in the new relation. But when the subject of Bible truth is presented for attention and consideration, the feeling at once arises. You married me knowing that I was what I am. I do not wish to be disturbed. From henceforth, let it be understood that conversation upon your peculiar views is to be interdicted. If the believer should manifest any special earnestness in regard to his faith, it might seem like unkindness toward the one who has no interest in the Christian experience. 
The believing one reasons that in his new relation, he must concede somewhat to the companion of his choice. Social worldly amusements are patronized. At first, there is great reluctance of feeling in doing this, but the interest in the truth becomes less and less, and faith is exchanged for doubt and unbelief. No one would have suspected that the once firm, conscientious believer and devoted follower of Christ could ever become the doubting, vacillating person that he now is. Oh, the change wrought by that unwise marriage. It is a dangerous thing to form a worldly alliance. Satan well knows that the hour that witnesses the marriage of many young men and women closes the history of their religious experience and usefulness. They are lost to Christ. They may for a time make an effort to live a Christian life, but all their strivings are made against a steady influence in the opposite direction. Once it was a privilege and joy to them to speak of their faith and hope, but they become unwilling to mention the subject, knowing that the one with whom they have linked their destiny takes no interest in it. As the result, faith in the precious truth dies out of the heart, and Satan insidiously weaves about them a web of skepticism. Can two walk together except they be agreed? If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. But how strange the sight! While one of those so closely united is engaged in devotion, the other is indifferent and careless. While one is seeking the way to everlasting life, the other is in the broad road to death. Hundreds have sacrificed Christ in heaven in consequence of marrying unconverted persons. Can it be that the love and fellowship of Christ are of so little value to them that they prefer the companionship of poor mortals? Is heaven so little esteemed that they are willing to risk its enjoyments for one who has no love for the precious Savior? To connect with an unbeliever is to place yourself on Satan's ground. You grieve the Spirit of God and forfeit his protection. Can you afford to have such terrible odds against you in fighting the battle for everlasting life? Ask yourself, will not an unbelieving husband lead my thoughts away from Jesus? He is a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God. Will he not lead me to enjoy the things that he enjoys? The path to eternal life is steep and rugged. Take no additional weights to retard your progress. The heart yearns for human love, but this love is not strong enough or pure enough or precious enough to supply the place of the love of Jesus. Only in her Savior can the wife find wisdom, strength, and grace to meet the cares, responsibilities, and sorrows of life. She should make him her strength and her guide. Let woman give herself to Christ before giving herself to any earthly friend and enter into no relation which shall conflict with this. Those who would find a true happiness must have the blessing of heaven upon all that they possess and all that they do. It is disobedience to God that fills so many hearts and homes with misery. My sister, unless you would have a home where the shadows are never lifted, do not unite yourself with one who is an enemy of God. What ought every Christian to do 
when brought into the trying position, which test the soundness of religious principle. With a firmness worthy of imitation, he should say frankly, I am a conscientious Christian. I believe the seventh day of the week to be the Sabbath of the Bible. Our faith and principles are such that they lead in opposite directions. We cannot be happy together. For if I follow on to gain a more perfect knowledge of the will of God, I shall become more and more unlike the world and assimilated to the likeness of Christ. If you continue to see no loveliness in Christ, no attractions in the truth, you will love the world which I cannot love while I shall love the things of God, which you cannot love. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And without spiritual discernment, you will be unable to see the claims of God upon me or to realize my obligations to the master whom I serve. Therefore, you will feel that I neglect you for religious duties. You will not be happy. You will be jealous on account of the affections which I give to God. And I shall be alone in my religious belief. When your views shall change, when your heart shall respond to the claims of God, and you shall learn to love my Savior, then our relationship may be renewed. The believer thus makes a sacrifice for Christ, which his conscience approves, and which shows that he values eternal life too highly to run the risk of losing it. He feels that it would be better to remain unmarried than to link his interest for life with one who chooses the world rather than Jesus, and who would lead away from the cross of Christ. It is only in Christ that a marriage alliance can be safely formed. Human love draws its closest bonds from divine love. Only where Christ reigns can there be deep, true, unselfish love. He who has entered the marriage relation while unconverted is by his conversion placed under stronger obligation to be faithful to his companion, however widely they may differ in regard to religious faith. Yet the claims of God should be placed above every earthly relationship, even though trials and persecution may be the result. With a spirit of love and meekness, this fidelity may have an influence to win the unbelieving one. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>